The one thing I want people to remember about Shane is that he fought valiantly to overcome this disease. And I don't want them to remember him as Shane the addict. I want them to remember Shane the happy person who would do anything for anybody. I was called out to do the ALS ice bucket challenge. I donated my $10. That would put his life before someone else's and I feel like that's how he died. Make sure you stir it around. Yeah, I know. Oh, this is horrible. This is big ice. Big piece of ice. What up? All right. Here we go. And remember how much he loved. Because he loved with his whole heart. When I grew up in Lawrence years ago, it was very quiet. It was just like every normal little city, no crime rate. It was really a nice place to grow up back in my day. My parents are immigrants to the city. Back in the 1960s, they worked in the mills uh, most of their uh, working life. Lawrence was a great place to grow up. Went outside every day, played with everybody in the neighborhood, you know, basically till the street lights came on. The city's kind of changed a little bit. Certainly the city's been hurt by, you know, losing a lot of the textile manufacturing. But it's always been a city that's always kind of fought for itself and the, and the people in it kind of have that sort of same, you know, mentality. during the 1980s. It was a city that was in transition. You know, there were drugs at that time, there was violence, and Lawrence was a hub of heroin at that time for the area, but it was mostly confined to the city. It's usually one of the hot spots. To the left and to the right of rooming houses where a lot of these people live that are dealing with addiction. It wasn't that bad, I don't think. I mean, back in the day, I certainly think it's gone, you know, probably progressively worse, like a lot of cities dealing with the opiate uh, crisis. Kind of brings everything else down. I mean, there's a lot of dealing and using going on in the city. A lot of outsiders coming into the city to buy drugs. Colorado, New Hampshire, down here, where there's a female by the car, a little ways away from it on the phone, and just, you know, looks you know, like they could be waiting to get hooked up on a bus. Yeah, we got them. New Hampshire, 420. I'll, uh, you know what, I'll wait, I'll give you a couple seconds and I'll drive up. I mean, the girl being down here out of Manchester, New Hampshire, is a little weird. I'll go check her out. I got in a fight with his ex-girlfriend yesterday, and I wanted to make sure he was that right. I've never been arrested. Is this your car? No, it's my boyfriend's. You don't mind if I look? I'm not him. So then why do you have... I don't have... It, it's in the car. We just bought this car. Who bought this car? My boyfriend. We've been averaging about 100 arrests a month. Well, you should be able to pull it up. Is this your purse? No. Yeah, it is. I'm Kim. I'm sorry. You know, 75, 80, 85 percent of the people that we arrest are drug-related, heroin-related, opiates are from mostly from out of state. Let's blame Lawrence. Lawrence is a trashy place or whatever. They, that's what they want to say. But the bottom line is these people are coming in here looking for the substance. I was born and raised here. So to see this sort of issue in the city, you know, it's heartbreaking. You don't want to be the, the place where you grew up to have that sort of reputation. This road runs straight up into Salem, New Hampshire, and then obviously the main uh, highways, Unit 93 and 495, also run right off of this route. They're really only going through, you know, probably a half a mile to get to Lawrence, so 
it's uh, not too difficult for them to access. When we first moved to Salem, we moved there purposely because we wanted to get the kids out of Lawrence because at that time, it was starting to get bad. So we moved to Salem and when my kids were younger, Salem was a great town to raise children in. There wasn't a lot of drugs or violence. So we thought that was a really great place. Shane played hockey as a young boy, um, probably for four or five years, and he excelled. He loved hockey. He tried playing baseball, wasn't a fan. I think he played more for us, but hockey was definitely his passion, and he, he was really good at it. If there are problems in Salem, no one's going to put that out in the open. There's a lot of people that hide their problems in this town, and I guess probably as you could see that maybe in any suburban community. There's a sense in the community that everything is wonderful and that we're not gonna talk about any problems. I can remember telling parents at a, at a parent meeting saying, your son comes in high every single day. And they got mad at me and said, you're wrong. Our son's not smoking pot and how do you even know? The parents didn't want to admit that there was a problem. And I think that carried into today's time. I mean, I'm someone that was a teacher, so I'm kind of like a helping professional. But what if I was just like a bus driver? Or what if I was just, you know, the guy that stocked the shelves at the grocery store? What's my incentive if it's not affecting my family? Because I just want to sit down and have a couple of beers and watch the Celtics on TV. I don't want to necessarily get up at, you know, 8 o'clock at night and meet some heroin addict at a coffee shop to try to help them get their lives straight. But, but I think that's what it's going to take. He probably started getting into trouble when he was probably like 14, 15. I met Shane. I was freshman year in high school, so about, you know, 15. We were all big into wrestling, like WWE. And we buy a ring online like a wrestling ring for like five grand. So that's how it happened. Shane was like, I fucking love wrestling. I was like, oh, word, that's perfect. I'm looking at this kid, I'm like, I'm like this kid's a fucking nut. Like. And I just remember him getting bashed in the, in the face. And his blood falling all over the place. I'm like, yo, you all right? Dude, I'm fucking fine. He goes, I'm just pissed that my nose won't stop bleeding. At first, I'm like, this kid's too much for me. Like, I don't know if I can handle him. That's exactly what I thought. Like, I'm gonna get in trouble with this kid. As my son got older, that's when we saw Salem going downhill as far as the drug epidemic. I've been a police officer almost 22 years now. I've been working with the Salem Police Department for 18 years. I grew up in Salem, majority of my life, 45 years I've spent here in Salem. What's great about this community is that we, we all look out for each other. I think my upbringing has made me uh, to be more understanding of a lot of the people I deal with. I think it's made me a better cop. There were times where it was difficult growing up financially, but we got through and uh, today I do well. As a police officer, it's made me realize when I'm dealing with people that are down and out and they, they may say, you don't understand, I'm, I can personalize and I, and I don't mind doing that. I, I let them know I do understand what it's like to, um, and to have that threat of losing your home or the threat of uh, you know, having your phone shut off, electricity shut off. and. Or not, ha you know, I, I get it, I get it. You, you, 
can look way out there and you just realize we're just one of hundreds of other communities in this state or this area that's impacted by the drug epidemic, the heroin and the fentanyl. It impacts everybody. So I can look out down this community, and it's a beautiful community from up here. But when you get into uh, up close with a person that's suffering from uh, addiction, you see how ugly it is. We know that the, uh, the heroin's in this community. It's all around us. Seems to be never ending. You gotta ask yourself whether or not what we're doing is, 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 is effective. You know, I think there's gotta, there's gotta be more than just arresting people, putting them in jail. There's gotta be more treatment, more education for the kids. Never use heroin or anything like that? Yes. All right. How did it all start with you? You know what I mean? Medical. Medical? What happened? We were in the hospital and got sick. I was in a coma like for so long. Like and a car accident or something like that? And listen, no, the, the, my, my intestines blew up. Your intestines blew up? All right. So you got, so you had some uh, medical issues. What were you prescribed? Do you remember? Um, oxycodone, the OPs, morphine, Dilaudid, fentanyl. Jeez, how long ago was that? Um, started in 2010. And okay. Then it, Before 2010, you, you were... Never did nothing. No shit. Drink. Yeah. Well, I do that, and too. Then, I do that. Yeah, the people think it's... A, the doctors are the ones that started this epidemic. It's sad to say, but it is. That What's that? I'm sorry, what's the that? The doctors started this epidemic. The doctors started it? They described you. Like I said, I was on medication, a lot of it. Have you t uh, tried rehab? Uh, once and... It's nothing, yeah, it's hard. It's not easy. Definitely not easy. It calls, it calls you every morning. You wake up, it calls you. All right, man. I appreciate your honesty, you really do. Nope. All right, so you know what? We gotta work with the doctors, get them to knock it off, right? Yeah, they don't want to stop the epidemic. Yeah. At 13, Shane had um, knee problems. He had a tumor underneath his knee, and he had to have the tumor removed and part of his kneecap removed. They kept him overnight and sent us home with a bottle of Percocets and told me, as his mother, to give them to him every four hours for five days. He told us after probably two days, he no longer needed those perks, but knew he liked that high. We have 20-somethings who are the experimenters, those who are seeking some sort of uh, alternative experience. They are not poor people or under underprivileged people. So these are people who had gainful employment, were productive citizens. Uh, they are not, by any means, anywhere close to the stereotypes that even in 2016, far too many people have. When I first started as chief medical examiner in New Hampshire in 1997, the state of New Hampshire typically had between 30 and 40 drug deaths a year. Now it is not uncommon at all for us to approach and even top 500 drug deaths a year, uh, literally a thousand percent increase. I would submit that it's impossible to keep up with the drug deaths. As we have become inundated with more and more of these cases, we can no longer autopsy them all. We don't have the staffing or the resources to do so. We face an interesting conundrum in New Hampshire. Most recent federal data suggests that we are number three in the nation in terms of per capita drug deaths. Yet we are number 49 in the nation in terms of access to treatment for drug addiction. I 
hope this issue goes straight to hell. It has been dispiriting to watch the parade of otherwise vibrant, young, healthy people come through here, their lives ended by something that they would have never picked for themselves or dreamed for themselves. You don't wake up one morning and say, oh gosh, I'm going to become an addict. What we're seeing is um, kids that start drinking at a young age, young age, smoking cigarettes, and eventually that, that high isn't enough, and they'll start using pills. When he was 16, that was the norm to start. When you partied, you took perks. We both started doing pills around the same time, actually. He was now addicted to perks and couldn't afford them. He was introduced to a 30-something-year-old guy that at the time lived in Salem, who was a Percocet dealer. So he would deal for this guy, and in turn, this guy would give him perks. And the two of us together were just like, we can make a lot of fucking money together, and we can also get as fucked up as we want together. The addiction just, obviously, the more you do, the more you need. Um, and this guy just kept feeding them to him. We would just have like $20,000 in our pocket, each of us, that we didn't owe. Like, it was our money, like, from that. So that's where it's like, we could just do this forever. No one's gonna catch us. But come to find out, this guy was working for the cops because he had a felony. So Shane got arrested and went to jail. You know, no one wants to see their best friend in jail or anything like that, especially after they thought they were on top of the world together. And that's when he went through the drug court program. So we spent every Wednesday going back and forth to Concord driving. And that's probably when we had our best talks um, about good, bad. Even though he was working full time, he still needed to account for some of his money. He always maintained whatever he had, a car or whatever. So he could no longer afford perks. So that's when Shane started doing heroin. Scratch chickens is something Shane and I always did together. Shane and I used to do this all the time. When I would scratch, Shane would always say, whatever you win, we're splitting. Anything over $2, half is mine. I always get a kind of a pit in my stomach when I drive through Salem or in Salem. It's full of memories for me with Shane, um, good and bad. Uh, it always kind of makes me a little emotional. It always just brings Shane back for in the forefront because we spent most of his life here.
once I really realized how bad Shane's addiction really was, um, and he went away to rehab, and the church I started going to had a program called Celebrate Recovery. And someone suggested that I go there to maybe learn to relate to what Shane was going through, but yet not be an enabler. And through these meetings, I did my homework on addiction and the disease of it. I learned about addiction because I didn't want to be that person that was saying he has a choice, he can just not use. And I believed for the longest time that Shane could just stop, just stop. I could show empathy and, and compassion, but not enable him, not be that mom that was gonna give money or we never threw him out, we never did any of that because for me, I didn't believe in that. So Shane had 16 months of incredible recovery on top of the world, um, would tell you he wasn't gonna go back. Faith had a huge part of Shane's sobriety. I never pushed what I believed or what I wanted to do on Shane. He chose to just come because he embraced it. Shane and Lisa had, you know, the best mother-son relationship I'd ever seen, where they could talk to each other about anything. Literally, we would do everything together. You know, get out of the house, drive around in the car together, just talk. I envied it, kind of. Like, I wanted a relationship with one of my parents like that. Having him in my life made a, uh, made a big difference. I'm the, I'm the one that's left out of the two of us. I don't have, like, the will to, like, do anything anymore, you know? It's life, unfortunately. You lose people you love. I know he's watch he's, he's probably watching me right now. I gotta keep doing it my part and what we were doing before, staying clean. And just living life the right way, because, you know, I know that's what he wants. He wouldn't want to see me up there with him anytime soon. And I don't plan on it. <laughs> Heroin on the street was cheap and easy to come by, but fentanyl is even more cost-effective for distributors to produce and distribute. I've come to find out through the medical examiner that they're now pressing it into pills, Percocets, Oxys, Xanax, anything that they can. They're lacing marijuana with fentanyl. Um, I'm, I'm just so disgusted. <laughs> In December of 2013, New Hampshire saw its first case of an overdose death due to this combination of heroin and fentanyl. Over the subsequent six months, as winter dissolved into spring and summer, we saw more and more of this combination, and then later began seeing fentanyl alone. Fentanyl is exceedingly potent. It's much more potent than heroin, sometimes 20 to 50 times or even 200 times more potent. For me and for our family and for all families of addicts, the fact that fentanyl is on the street and it is being sold and given to people feels like murder. The potency of these agents is such that if they use the amount that they're used to using, if they have become habituated to heroin, it's a recipe for disaster. So I'm sure he thought he got heroin and he knew what he could do. The medical examiner confirmed that he in fact had been given fentanyl, straight fentanyl, um, no heroin. 
they make choices and I understand that. Um, but I strongly believe in my heart if someone handed Shane a bag and said, here, it's some fentanyl, he would never have done it. When people talk about the empty chair, it's definitely a thing. You always notice. Hey, how are you? How are you? Good, how are you? You kind of like have to let people do it on their terms. Gary's very, very private about it. I think we know, and not that we expect otherwise, but everybody's life goes on, and ours is still the same. We don't even know what a new normal is yet. We have a male cardinal that comes. Cardinals are a sign of loved ones. Sometimes he comes on days, significant days, but lately he's been hanging around all the time. He lands wherever. Um, kind of brings comfort for that moment anyway. I think everybody has a dark side and a bright side. Unfortunately, in addiction, the addict's dark side can come out even if they don't want it to come out. He was supposed to go see a counselor, and he didn't because his friend had overdosed in his car, and he had to get help. He came home, and he was kind of edgy, and when I asked what was wrong, he said that the night had been too much for him. and said goodnight to us both like he always did. And he hugged his dad, which was a little unusual. Told us both that he loved us, and he went to bed. And at 4.30, I got up to wake him up, and his TV was on. Um, so I kind of in my gut knew something was off. And when I walked in, he was curled in a ball on his bed. And I immediately knew. It's very quiet. Shane did most of the talking. So yeah, it's it's very strange. We're at Hedgehog Pond in Salem, New Hampshire. This is where Shane and I got baptized. I come here every once in a while when I'm in this area or if I'm having a really bad day. This, this place can bring some peace, some good memories. Being baptized together was quite an amazing thing to share with him. Just showed me how much his faith meant to him at that point. The day of baptism, he had asked his dad to come, so he was really excited that his dad was gonna come watch us. And to see him embrace it, and to know that he was doing it because he wanted to do it, he wanted to take that next step. I think it's very, very, very important that an addict has love and family support, as well as outside support. I think that's a big piece. I think support is a huge piece. It's 
someone once asked me what I would do when I no longer had to be Shane's voice, I don't see that ending anytime soon. This epidemic is not even coming close to a halt. Right now I feel I'm being led to be supportive of other moms and dads. And it helps me feel like I'm keeping Shane alive. Turning to know